In the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. Happy Easter, everyone. The mystery of the resurrection of Jesus Christ is so easy to understand. No, nope. it is so complex and important and earth changing that we, the church, set aside an entire season to reflect on it. The great 50 days of Easter began last Sunday on the Feast of the Resurrection, and they run all the way up until the Feast of Pentecost in the middle of May. We take our time in these great 50 days to read and reread the stories of the first Easter and the early church in order to try and wrap our heads around this difficult and profound truth, these things that these stories reveal about Jesus, about God, and about us. Today, we hear a story that is familiar to many of us as the story of doubting Thomas. And Thomas's story, his holy doubt, his intimate revelation of the resurrection, his profound declaration of Jesus's divinity, it is all very important. But this morning, I would like to focus on what might seem to be a minor detail in this story, but one that I believe has profound implications for all of us as followers of Jesus. Jesus, of course, has been betrayed, beaten, and crucified. He died and was buried, and then, miraculously, he was raised from the dead, defeating death and opening the way to everlasting life. So what does it mean for us as Christians that after all of that, the first thing that Jesus says to his disciples after his resurrection is, peace be with you. And he does this not only once, not twice, but three times in this reading. He does it twice on that first Easter evening and then again a third time when he comes back. And three, of course, is a nice biblical number for saying, hey, pay attention. The gospel tells us that the disciples have been hiding behind locked doors, and they have plenty of reason to be on edge, to be afraid. For weeks, Jesus had been telling them that he would be betrayed and killed in Jerusalem. When Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead, they heard murmurings among some in the crowd who had started to plot to kill him. They felt the joy of the crowds as Jesus rode into Jerusalem on the back of the donkey, but then they felt that joy gradually give way to first tension and then outright animosity as Jesus spent each day teaching in the temple. They even saw some of the religious leaders pick up stones as if ready to execute Jesus on the spot. So, when the temple police came to arrest Jesus, many of them ran to hide. Judas had betrayed them, just like Jesus said. He had led the temple police right to them there in the garden, which begged the question, what else might Judas have told them? They, of course, were Jesus' inner circle. Perhaps they were next. And so they hid for much of Jesus' trial and crucifixion. They went back into that upper room and they locked the doors, placing as much of a barrier as they could between themselves and the hostile outside world. No doubt they wept when Mary and the beloved disciple and the other women came to the upper room and told them that Jesus had died. No doubt their grief mingled with shame at having run to hide instead of bravely contending alongside their Lord and teacher. And then, on Sunday morning, Mary returned, saying that the tomb was empty, that Jesus' body was gone. They couldn't make sense of this. P 
Peter and the beloved disciple ran to the tomb and saw it empty, the linen clothes neatly rolled to the side, and still they didn't know what to do next. Perhaps they were afraid that they might be accused of having hidden Jesus' body. But then when Mary came and said that she had seen the risen Jesus, they were even more confused. What if she was wrong? But also, what if she was right? And I think that given all of this, it is perfectly reasonable for them to think that maybe if Jesus had come back and knew that they had hidden, that they had turned their backs on him, perhaps they were afraid that Jesus might come and punish them for abandoning him in his hour of need. But then he is there, standing in front of them, very much alive, and yet uninhibited by walls and locked doors, and he says, peace be with you. He shows them his gloriously resurrected body still bearing the wounds of his crucifixion and says, peace be with you. This peace that Jesus offers his disciples is unexpected, but it is also something more than just peace. This is not tranquility. This is not just good vibes. Jesus is offering a profound forgiveness, grace, reconciliation to a broken, frightened, and hurting community. Our collect for this Sunday declares that God establishes a covenant of reconciliation in the paschal mystery of Jesus' passion death, and resurrection. True reconciliation is difficult to define and even more difficult to achieve. The Archbishop of Canterbury, the most reverend Justin Welby, has spoken about reconciliation as the transformation of violent and destructive conflict into nonviolent and creative disagreement. Violent and destructive conflict into nonviolent and creative disagreement. Recently, I was talking with some uh, young people in our congregation, and one of them asked me what reconciliation means, and um, I tried to define it as cleanly as I could. I said that reconciliation is something like forgiveness plus. It is a forgiveness that is so profound that resentment melts away. True reconciliation is not forgive and forget. It is, in fact, a kind of remembering and then forgiving all the same. To be genuinely reconciled is to be able to sit across the table from someone with whom we disagree on everything at a deep, immovable level, and yet are miraculously able to look at one another and talk as beloved equals, differences and all. It is no accident that this collect was assigned to this Sunday where we hear this story. The Paschal mystery of Jesus' passion, death, and resurrection brings reconciliation in two major ways. The first is between God and humanity. In Jesus' incarnation, God took on mortal flesh to live and die and rise again with and for us. This eliminated the boundaries between immortal and mortal, between heaven and earth, God and humanity. In Jesus, heaven and earth meet, and that connection, that divine reconciliation, cannot be undone. What's more, Jesus' resurrection reconciles God and humanity so much that human mortality is reconfigured into God's vision of eternal life for all of us. That is to say, in Jesus, God has repaired the relationship between you and God once and for all, establishing a life-giving relationship of love and grace that cannot, cannot be broken. That part is great. It's 
The second part of this covenant of reconciliation is that's where things get tricky. Because immediately after Jesus offers peace to his disciples, he sends them out into the world. He gives them the gift of the Holy Spirit and tells them to go out to forgive sins, to proclaim the good news, to share that peace and reconciliation that they have received with the rest of the world. They need to stop hiding behind locked doors and go out and share the love of God. And that is difficult. It's difficult enough to share reconciliation and peace with the people that we know and love. But it is so much more difficult to share it with the people we don't love. The reconciliation that Jesus offers to his disciples, to us, is offered likewise to all people. Also, maybe especially, to the people that you and I think least worthy of God's grace and love and reconciliation. Being fully reconciled with people who look and think and act like we do is one thing, but being fully reconciled with them, with the people we hate, with the people who perhaps hate us, that is one of the most challenging things about Christianity. It turns out that my own salvation is wrapped up entirely in the salvation of the people I think do not deserve it. If the resurrected Jesus, who had every reason to reject his friends for betraying and abandoning him, comes to his disciples offering peace and reconciliation, how much more must we work towards reconciliation with one another. What are the walls that we have erected between ourselves and others? Who do you try to keep out by hiding behind the locked doors of shame or fear or hatred? What will it take to be reconciled to open those doors to make way for God's peace and love. That, it turns out, is the challenging work of the church. That is our job. And that is why Jesus equips the disciples, equips us with the gift of the Holy Spirit, without whose help reconciliation would be impossible. Which brings us back to doubting Thomas. Thomas was not an enemy, certainly, but he did become an outsider, quite literally, when he missed Jesus' first appearance. Whether it's because he was feeling stubborn or hurt or simply having trouble believing their testimonies, he asks for proof, refuses to believe, until he has received the same level of evidence that his friends received. This, whether we like it or not, drove a wedge between Thomas and his community. But, seemingly without incident, a whole week goes by, and Thomas is still there. He hasn't been cast out or labeled an unbeliever, and almost more miraculously, he hasn't withdrawn and hidden himself behind locked doors. A whole week later, Thomas is still with his community, being held in his uncertainty and doubt. It's almost as if the community has had an opportunity to practice reconciliation, but like on easy mode. So when Jesus returns a second time and again enters the room without regard to locked doors, he again says, peace be with you, extending his arms to Thomas, whose declaration of Jesus' divinity gives the community the courage they need to step out into the world and do the work that Jesus has given them. In practicing reconciliation, we open ourselves to the possibility of encountering the risen Christ. Jesus gently but persistently challenges us 
to transform our isolating, violent, and destructive instincts into the life-giving creativity of Christian community. At our best, the church is a place where people from all backgrounds and experiences can come together and stand reconciled as equals around God's table. At our best, the church unlocks the doors and tears down the walls that the world outside would erect between us, making way for the kingdom of God where we will all stand reconciled together forever. We get glimpses of that here in church so that when we go back out into the world, we have, it's almost like we have an imprint of it on our hearts. Through the Paschal mystery, the covenant of reconciliation, you stand reconciled with the God who created the heavens and the earth, who took on mortal flesh in Jesus Christ, and who comes again and again and again to you, offering peace and grace. And you, as a result, are empowered by the Holy Spirit to share that grace and peace, that reconciliation with those around you, so that together we might unlock the doors and tear down the walls that divide us and step together into God's kingdom. Amen.